Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, uh, very good evening. This is just a brief welcome. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the delegation of Prague to the European Union at the Prague House tonight. We are very glad that we can host this event, another edition of the Science Cafe, the first one in the year 2024. And we are very glad we can participate in this event together with the main organizers, representation of the uh, South Moravian region to the European Union, uh, Czech Liaison Office for Education and Research, and uh, um, Czech Center Brussels. So tonight's topic is Earth Observation Possibilities and Challenges, and I will leave further introduction of the speakers and uh, the moderator to my colleague. Um, we hope that you will take active part during this evening by asking questions and giving out your comments and uh, thoughts. And afterwards, we will have a glass of wine for you. But uh, let's uh, have the evening started now. I will pass on the floor to uh, my colleague from the Ch Czech Liaison Office. Thank you and have a nice evening at the Prague House. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the welcoming here, us here. Um, my name is Lenka Prochaskova. As was already said, I am head of Czech Lyson Office for Education and Research here in Brussels. And uh, me and my team, we are really happy that uh, we can welcome you here in such a number uh, in the first edition of this year. Uh, as it was already said, uh, the topic is Earth Observation. And uh, we are really thrilled to see so many eager faces here uh, prepared to ask questions after the Science Cafe. But before we kick things off, uh, also from my side, I would like to thank to all of our colleagues from uh, Prague House, from Czech Center Brussels, and from the representation of South Moravia uh, to the EU, uh, because they are fabulous colleagues organizing this event. Now, let's uh, give a warm welcome to our moderator of the evening, uh, Vera Pinto. Vera is a policy and equality coordinator at DG DEFIS of the European Commission, driving the development of EU space aligned with EU goals. Drawing on her expertise in political science, finance and security, among others, uh, she promotes environmental sustainability in space activities. So, Vera, the floor is yours and enjoy the whole evening. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be once again in the Science Cafe, and today we are going again to travel to space. And space is actually one of my favorite places to be in. It's actually my job. Uh, so um, it is quite interesting to see the interest also in what we do in Earth observation and how space, and Earth observation in particular, can help us on Earth solving our problems. So today we are going to talk about Earth observation, like we already said multiple times, and indeed the investments in Earth observation in the last years are being quite significant. An example of it is Copernicus, the European Union Earth Observation System, but also investments like Landsat in the US or Radarsat in Canada. So of course the Earth observation systems and collecting these data about and having this eye on Earth and how it is, is almost like taking the vital signs of Earth. And we do know that these days with climate change uh, and with all the uh, events that happen around it, we know that the vital signs of Earth are not most spectacular these days. So we really need to pay attention and to monitor it closely. And of course, this Systems are quite useful on environmental monitoring, resource management, for example, but also about disaster planning and how we respond to disasters and to extreme events that unfortunately will happen more and more. So despite all the growing applications that we are being seeing linked to space data and to space services, there are still a lot of communities that face barriers in accessing this data and using it on their behalf. And it can be because of connectivity issues or it can be even for lack of resources. So today, our two speakers, We'll precisely talk about this. They will explain a bit about the methods and the data, the, how do we see Earth and from, from space, and how we can use this data in nature protection, in agriculture, climate change, uh, and even for security. But we will also look at academic curricular and the skilled needs, what is there, and also represents an opportunity for us on Earth. And of course, 
We will also touch upon a very important aspect that is precisely this capacity building and this sustainable expansion of the use of these space data to communities that today they don't have the same access as we have in Europe or in the US or in other countries. So without further ado, because I, I'm not the one who is going to explain you all of this, but it's actually our two speakers uh, that I will in, then introduce. I will start by Lucy. Lucy heads the Department of Applied Geoinformatics and Cartography at Charles University in Prague. Uh, she's an expert in monitoring vegetation using satellite data, and she also leads research projects that go from forest health, land, land use changes, and much, much more. Uh, she also coordinates regional networks, and of course, enjoys family time, travel, and Asian history. Um, and then our, our second speaker is Pet. He's a co-owner and a space strategy manager at TLR Space Systems. Is actually an expert in leveraging space technology to tackle global cha challenges. And previously, he developed space applications at the Czech Academy of Science and conducted research in space technology and policy at European University Institute and the Charles University. And he has also a background in think tanks and private intelligence. So he also has a background as foreign policy analyst. And I think this will bring a very interesting perspective later on on our questions and answers part. So we will, of course, hear from our speakers. You will have also the opportunity to ask questions after the presentations. So keep your thoughts, all the questions you might have, because we are also here to try to reply to them. Uh, and with no further ado, I pass the floor to Lucy. Thank you, Vera. Uh, good evening. It's very nice to see so many faces interested in Earth observation and space. And uh, my part, I would like to Pre uh, present something about uh, Earth observation fundamentals. I don't know how experienced is uh, this audience, so I will go very quickly through the basics of Earth observation and um, then about our academic uh, and research activities and what is like uh, the most important point, I would say, it's uh, that I will speak about something that is invisible and at the same time it's very essential. So, spatial remote sensing as observation is uh, something that is uh, really based on sun, on energy and on uh, it's uh, something that we can uh, see and evaluate uh, from the distance so remotely and uh, we um, have uh, many, many uh, possibilities um, not just for image uh, remote sensing but we have also possibility to use some tools on the earth surface what is very important it is um, of course electromagnetic spectrum and uh, what is uh, based, what is uh, important on this is that uh, remote sensing can see uh, what is invisible for human eye. And this is uh, our uh, job to use instruments and uh, to see uh, using these instruments uh, these uh, wavelengths that are special and that can be seen just uh, to this um, way uh, on the base on the remote sensing. And for example, uh, vegetation and all objects on the Earth's surface uh, have some special reflectance uh, during uh, the whole spectrum. And based on this, we can have special uh, features, we can see them using these instruments. Uh, in reality, you can see everything using RGB bands and uh, this is what we call uh, really 
uh, composite in true colors. And this is what is possible to see by your eyes. But what is the magic of the remote sensing is that uh, we can also use so uh, so-called false colors, and we can use this portion of spectrum that is uh, acquired in invisible for human eyes, invisible bands or uh, portions of the spectrum. For example, when you see this image, there are two playgrounds. Can you estimate which one has uh, really natural grass and which one has artificial grass? <laughs> no. Yes, this is uh, what is the limit of the human eyes. But we have so-called a false color composite. Uh, can you assume it now? Be careful, because this is false color composite. And uh, the red one is surprisingly natural grass, because in this combination of bands, uh, we don't see true colors, but these false colors. So this is the magic of the Earth's observation. And uh, on these uh, figures, you can see the small portion that is visible by human eyes and the big portion that can be visible using Earth's observation. And uh, each object reflects a, a special, uh, has special features, and you can uh, describe it using so-called spectral curve. And spectral curve can distinguish objects on the Earth's surface, uh, but not just di distinguish. When we have this such detailed spectral curve, we can evaluate not just uh, what is what, but we can also evaluate the state of the object. So it is very important, and it is the magic of Earth's observation. And uh, what is important for the project uh, about which we are going to speak, it's, uh, these are features of uh, images of remote sensing data. For example, one of them is spatial resolution. You can see the same uh, place on different images with different size of pixel. And when you go to the detail, uh, to small pixel, it's better spatial resolution, and you can see much better the detail on the Earth's surface. Uh, then we have uh, spectral resolution, and it is about how much bands we have in our data. Uh, this way we can distinguish so-called multispectral and hyperspectral data. Multispectral data have just several bands, and hyperspectral data have many adjacent and very narrow bands. So we have very detailed spectral curve, and this is the feature that can tell us more about the state, health, water content, chlorophyll content, and so on. You cannot find this in multispectral data, but you have it in hyperspectral data. This is example of spectral curve uh, that you can acquire from both types of data. And then we have also temporal resolution. We have image for the same, same place on the Earth's surface. We can have a dense time series, we can have long time series of images, and we can also consider changes within one season, so-called phenological changes, for example, for vegetation. It's very, very important. And as for acquisition, it's uh, very important when you plan project to select good data type according to these resolutions that I was speaking about. So uh, you should decide between UAV, between airplane or satellite, and uh, you also, based on this, can acquire a different type of data. You, we have uh, passive or active sensing, and uh, this uh, gives us 
many uh, different types of data that can be finally combined and we can have much better information. So this is about the introduction into remote sensing and now several information about education at our university, at our department. Uh, we are very much specialized on remote sensing, maybe uh, one of uh, most uh, specialized university in Czechia. We have a master program uh, and a PhD program. Our bachelor programs are more general, uh, geographical, and um, we have also some special open courses that we have developed and we have also uh, many uh, collaborators in abroad that we can um, use uh, as uh, for exchanges and uh, our students uh, have uh, possibility to go abroad in uh, the framework of, on, of Erasmus and also in the framework of our project collaborations because we have also several international projects and we also organize so-called uh, transatlantic training that uh, is a collaboration with NASA, ESA and it is uh, for master and PhD students. It's um, organized each year. So uh, what is very important to involve our students also into the projects uh, during master and also PhD studies because they are very interested, they create um, their thesis uh, on the projects and they stay is with us longer, that is very nice and important for us. Uh, I have here tables how many uh, courses we have uh, in bachelor and master studies and I would stress that for example we have course uh, focusing on laboratory and image spectroscopy this is all about the hyperspectral data that I mentioned and we have a really huge amount of uh, different uh, courses uh, or from basics of remote sensing then we have courses oriented on different types of data like uh, radar lidar and also what is very important for the students is programming mathematics and uh, other um, subjects in uh, ge uh, geoinformatics like cartography and uh, gis so uh, we also have, uh, you can find examples of our thesis on uh, the link that I put here because the thesis, it's very important part of uh, work with our students and we re really enjoy it because it's especially when uh, they work on our projects. Uh, this is shortly about education and I hope you will have some questions for it. And finally, some examples of our projects. Uh, we love <laughs> uh, our Krkonoše mountains and uh, our island of Tandra in the Central Europe. And we work there for many years uh, to uh, prepare methodology for monitoring of vegetation using remote sensing. This is a very special area with rich biodiversity, but there are some problems during last years, as you may know, as it rains in the last century, and also change of management. Now it is zone without management, and what is interesting, that it supposedly even uh, this uh, loss of, of the management practices in this area could lead into the loss on biodiversity. So we try to develop methodology using UAV hyperspectral and multispectral data. Uh, we acquired data for four years for four uh, areas and uh, we collaborated very much with, uh, with the uh, uh, National Park uh, 
and administration and with botanists and people there. And uh, finally, we were really able, in this spatial detail, we have pixel size three centimeters. And uh, we really need to find very small changes of some grasses uh, to evaluate if there is really uh, the problem of biodiversity. So uh, we developed this methodology. And uh, another project are focusing on forests. Uh, we uh, developed uh, some uh, maps uh, showing uh, condition of forests. For this, we use hyperspectral aerial data and uh, also satellite data, Landsat Sentinel-2. Uh, this is also collaboration with the National Park. And finally, I would like to show you another project that we had together with Tierra Al Company in Maldives. And uh, we went to the two islands, Gordu and Fudahu, uh, last year. Just uh, we were there in this time last year. And it was very nice because we collaborated with the local people and uh, with Maldives Research Space Organization and the goal was to evaluate problems of these uh, beautiful islands like seagrass expansion, coral breaching, uh, mangroves uh, uh, like this uh, destruction and also some uh, uh, agricultural crops and their uh, health. So we went there with our drone and hyperspectral camera. We had uh, finally many overflights and we acquired data. You can see flight plans and some outputs that we got. Uh, and we hope that uh, this data will contribute to save and preserve these beautiful islands and their biodiversity and will help also the people there because uh, you can see on this picture uh, they were really happy to have us there and we were happy to be there and I suppose that also Petr will add something to this topic. Thank you. Thank you Lucy. Considering the current weather in Brussels, I think we are all eager that uh, Petr also takes us to the Maldives. But before that, Lucy, I do have a question for you because I retain uh, some words that you said that was, Earth observation sees what we cannot see with our human eyes. And I think this is quite impressive and you show us a few, even tricking our minds with the false colors. <laughs> Um, but in, indeed, the amount of knowledge that is accumulated, even at, at academic, the projects that you just went through is quite impressive. And I was wondering how we make this knowledge transfer to companies and to the communities. Maybe you could explain a bit uh, more uh, in, uh, in a short one minute. <laughs> I'm the time, time guardian. Uh, but in, uh, maybe to explain a bit about this transfer of the academic knowledge to the commercialization aspects too. Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, this is, of course, a very important issue and uh, not easy. I would say it's rather complicated because academic um, work <laughs> uh, sometimes is really special, but we have some tools to uh, do this. For example, just now we are working on um, uh, preparation of spin-off uh, for our department and um, there are of course some problems uh, because we are small department and uh, uh, these activities need uh, rather uh, many people but uh, we believe that university will help us with this but f so far we had um, other possibilities like uh, I mentioned this collaboration, for example, with administrations of the national parks that is very important for us because it's close to, uh, to the practice and uh, people from national parks are nowadays really very far uh, 
uh, many administrations own uh, their own drones and uh, they are very good partners for uh, discussion and they know what they want for, from us and we try to really be close to their needs. And uh, there is also another tool, for example, some applied projects, uh, like some agencies in, uh, in Czechia uh, that uh, have special types of projects and we really provide applied uh, outputs that are used in uh, different uh, sectors, uh, usually uh, we work also with um, some um, like nature preservation organizations, but uh, this is really uh, strict and we have to be close uh, uh, to, um, to practice. And of course, on this project, we collaborate with private companies that are from space sector. And uh, this is a very good way how to uh, in introduce our outputs uh, to the practice. Thank you, Lucy. I'm sure that you also have questions for Lucy, so please hold them just a bit longer until we uh, hear also from Pret, and then we will open uh, the floor for all your questions, and we will try that our speakers reply to it. And with this, Pet, you have a big responsibility, because now we are hoping that you take us back to the Maldives and Earth of, and space. <laughs> so the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Vera, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, such a great turnout. It's, um, it's nice to see everyone interested in Earth observation and, and space. Um, on the way here, we discussed that exactly last year, at this time, we were in the Maldives, uh, exactly here. Um, but it's, it's very nice to be here as well. Um, <clears throat> let's, 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 leave it at, let's leave it at that. Um, I will talk a bit about um, uh, our company, what we do. Um, and then a bit about the project, such the one as we did in the Maldives, but in principle of what we use Earth observation for and how we believe it's, uh, it can be a force for good um, and can um, help us solve many issues. <clears throat> so first of all, a bit about our company. We are a satellite integrator company, so we build satellites um, in the Czech Republic. Um, we build customized missions for Earth observation as well as communications for different, um, uh, different entities, governmental or commercial. Um, we also work on lunar missions. I'll have a few, few uh, sentences about that as well. Um, and we started just um, uh, a little bit over two years ago, um, and um, uh, we come a long way. Um, uh, we are working um, or finishing three satellites that will fly this year. We're working on two lunar missions um, and we're developing five different space products. Um, uh, we are going to be in three countries, so <clears throat> we open a branch in Rwanda, Africa. Um, we're opening one in Asia this year. Um, uh, we have 51 people um, uh, this year um, and um, uh, some other boring numbers. Um, but we are at the beginning um, and what I would like to talk about is um, about our strategy and what we're trying to do as a company, which is not um, um, not the numbers, but um, a mission that we have. And um, I, I structure our strategy into three different pillars. One is how we can address the main challenges here on Earth, how we can extend benefits benefits of space and Earth observation to developing countries, um, and how we can sustainably expand into space as a humanity. Um, I everything that I mentioned is kind of underlie that we are a European company. Um, we understand that we have a sort of a geopolitical role um, uh, because we believe that Europe should be a geopolitical player. Um, and that is also why we expand into other, um, other uh, regions um, uh, in the world. Uh, we opened a branch in Rwanda last year. Um, there's an important aspect of um, uh, us acting a as a counterweight to um, a Chinese competition. Um, I say it out here frankly. Um, we also do a lot of um, uh, support projects and activities in Ukraine to help them use satellites for uh, their fight, which is our fight. Um, so a little, little detour here um, uh, to encourage you to do everything you can right now um, in your Brussels um, uh, connections to help us um, um, help Ukraine win this war because it's also our war. Um, but um, I'll continue with uh, telling you a little bit about what we do. We, we do not just um, sell satellites um, as, a, as, a, as a company to countries. We always try to approach countries as a, as a partner. Um, and um, it helps us a bit to be from a small country, from a small Eastern European country. 
we do come to African countries um, with, uh, with less of a historical baggage, let's say. It allows us to talk to them a bit more directly. Um, but our offer does not include just selling a satellite and, and leaving a country. We offer a partnership in a way that we build localized manufacturing. We help um, uh, to teach students and people um, in those countries to be able to build the satellites and use the space data themselves. Um, we try to teach them how to use Earth observation data to solve their specific problems and how to build specifically designed satellites to solve their specific issues. And that's kind of core of our strategy and you know, how we try to make sure that uh, you know, space benefits and use of Earth observation data reaches everyone, not just those in the developed countries. Um, so, for example, in Rwanda, we have established a bachelor program in aerospace. Um, we're working with other universities to establish pr programs and trainings. Um, we are this year's starting program where we bring um, um, uh, space engineers in training from Rwanda to us in the Czech Republic to Brno um, so they can participate in our uh, manufacturing of satellites um, directly in the Czech Republic and then go back to our branch there and work in the branch and build satellites there. Um, because what countries, um, developing countries are interested in is not developing aid, but you know, helping to be able to um, be regular partners and competitors in a regular economy on their own. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, sorry, a little bit of a delay here. Oh, there we go. Um, one of the things we're doing um, this year is that um, in Africa we're starting to build um, the first African satellites um, at the local AIT center, which is sort of a core of the infrastructure where you test, qualify, and integrate the whole satellite. Um, and uh, these are satellites that can be used for different things from Earth observation, for security, communications, um, and many other things. Um, <clears throat> but I will get you to what you want to hear the most, which is the Maldives. Um, and I think the Maldives kind of show um, uh, what we can do um, uh, with the hyperspectral sensing there. Um, so as Lucy talked about, um, we carried out this, uh, this pilot project that we monitored uh, different things in the Maldives with hyperspectral sensing. Um, this year we are sending in October our own hyperspectral satellite that we will use for Rwanda, the Maldives and other countries to provide them with hyperspectral data um, at a very high resolution so they can use it and, and learn how to use this data. But to learn how to use Earth observation data, you have to know very a lot of things about you know what you're doing um, and you have to have some basic first knowledge so for that we carry out hyperspectral sensing pilot project where we take a, a, a drone and we do in situ measurements to identify the specific spectral signatures of different phenomena. Lucy talked about many of them water content chlorophyll content nitrogen content um, farming practices um, to address the specific things and the specific crops because you need to do this in essentially every country for every plant um, in order to be able to automatically detect these things from a satellite. So, so this, is, this is the core of um, how we use hyperspectral data. Um, 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 we have a project in Rwanda where we try to understand what farming practices they use, um, how much uh, fertilizer they use, um, how much water they use, uh, because farming in these uh, countries is obviously still a core part of their economy um, and it's very challenging to do. Um, one of the simple examples I have here is these images from um, our project in the Maldives. Um, as you can see um, uh, on the picture on the left, you can see just uh, you know, um, uh, regular, in regular colors what the specific, um, uh, specific palm tree field looks like. Um, and we apply different algorithms um, uh, to detect health, um, 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 uh, chlorophyll content to identify the patches where the plants were not doing well. And you can see in the picture in the middle uh, that you can actually um, uh, see some differences there. Um, we have a, um, another example with chlorophyll measuring. Uh, with the regular eye, you can see on the left, you don't see much of a difference, but when you use the different indices um, from the algorithms we run, um, you can tell that there is something happening there. So this is just a simple example here. Um, another thing that we measured in the Maldives is the seagrass, um, uh, not growth, but they have actually a problem of, with seagrass dying off. Um, and we try to see where the seagrass is actually dying and where the seagrass is actually growing. Um, and if you see on the picture on the left, you, you um, close to the shore, 
you see that there is a still sort of a, a black band of the seagrass, um, but when we used um, a regular NDVI index, you could actually tell that um, this seagrass is dead, that it's actually not um, um, a, a living there. Um, <clears throat> one other thing, I, two other things I wanted to also mention that fit the strategy as uh, space sustainability. Um, <clears throat> we are on a path to have uh, close to 100,000 objects in space. Right now, half of them are owned by Elon Musk, and we do not possess the means um, to manage this um, orbit and this, uh, this, this space, this near space, effectively. Um, what you can see over there on the left is just a small millimeter-sized uh, ball of aluminum and what it does to a very thick um, aluminum um, uh, plate um, at the orbital speeds that, uh, that, the, that, uh, that we see um, every day. Um, what we're trying to do with this is to develop a new laser system that is actually going to detect these objects at an uh, unparalleled pr uh, precision and help us to avoid these essentially car crashes. Um, <clears throat> here's just a picture of our satellite that's flying up um, this October um, that is going to have this new LiDAR system. It's also going to have a hyperspectral camera, as I mentioned, uh, but this should help us sort of uh, keep the, the orbit sustainable as much as possible. Um, last thing I'm going to mention that fits the strategy um, is that we're trying to make sure that we expand into space sustainably. Um, uh, these are our lunar missions. Uh, where we position ourselves is lunar orbiters. Um, we work on different, four different lunar orbiter missions um, with ESA and NASA. Um, you can actually find video of one of the mission concepts on, on YouTube if you look up uh, TRL Space um, uh, LUGO, which is Lunar Geology Orbiter. Um, but what we're trying to do here is to pick a good area where um, European small, medium companies can play an important part in the lunar economy. It is going to be the next biggest economy that we enter as a world, um, and uh, we want to be part of that. And we're not doing it only for ourselves, we're also doing it with our partners in Africa, in Asia, and make sure they are part of this new journey of humanity to be part of you know, moving humanity outside in space. And why I say that we try to do this sustainably, <clears throat> um, what we do is that we um, essentially not only do Earth observation, but lunar observation. The lunar orbiters are there to find what's interesting in space uh, or on the moon, what type of resources there are. Um, because if we are going back to the moon, we need to go there to stay and use the local resources to not be shifting everything from Earth um, and have the capability to build things locally. Uh, to do that, we have to know what's up there, uh, which we do not know. So that's, uh, that's just a short, a short, uh, short um, uh, coverage of what we do for the moon. Um, and maybe I'll end here and, uh, and leave it up for other questions um, from Vera or from you guys. But uh, thanks, thanks for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Petr. And before we open the questions for our audience, that I do hope uh, that they have a lot of them, because I do have a lot of them, but this is not for me to ask a lot of questions. But I will allow me to do one, Petr, if you allow me, uh, that is precisely linked to extending these benefits of Earth observation to developing countries. Because you said something that is very interesting, that is you go there, you, you train them, you teach them, you work with them. But maybe you could elaborate a bit more, because indeed, when we speak about sustainability, sustainability, uh, and I come from a country that unfortunately doesn't have a good record, <laughs> um, it, is, it would be quite interesting also to understand how we can leverage on Earth observation to work together with um, developing countries and precisely taking these sustainability as multi-sustainability aspects into account. If you could elaborate a bit more, that would be great. <clears throat> so um, I think if we um, make these technologies and these practices and this knowledge um, accessible and available to developing countries, uh, there's gonna be a lot new things that we will also learn ourselves. Um, if I have learned something um, from you know, um, repeatedly going to uh, developing countries in Asia or specifically to Africa, um, uh, wh which is not even connected to space, it's that there's a lot more that we can learn from them that, um, that we believe. Um, across everything, um, not, only, um, uh, not only, you know, things like governance and many, many other things. Um, and uh, for Earth observation, I think um, because, for example, the hyperspectral sensing, it does require you to identify the specific spectral signatures of different things, 
locally, um, and this kind of it does kind of force you to you know open your book and and learn um, another way how to detect different things. Um, and that just increases your overall knowledge and will help you to detect them back in Europe, for example. Um, I think that's important. Um, and I think what else is important is that um, when we actually um, when we actually go there and understand what their problems are, um, we know that the solutions that maybe we see that um, would help them out and that we offer them are much more, let's say, Eurocentric. Um, and they really need to have their own capability um, to design their own solution, to design their own satellite, and understand how to operate it um, 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 in order to actually receive the benefits. And I think it's a very valuable experience. So um, it might be not, not that much, it might not be only about us learning practically how to do Earth observation better, but just, just going on that journey with them and understanding their perception, which is a value of itself, I think. Indeed, I think that is also a very good uh, starting point of the importance of different perspectives and take them on board. To jump to the questions from our audience, so I would just ask you to raise your hand because we have a person that will pass you the microphone so that we can hear your question. Uh, and so this is the moment, and I see already a very eager question popping up, that's good. So thank you, if you could just tell us your name and the question, and if it is specifically for one of the speakers or both, please. Okay, good evening. Um, my name is Vojta, and I think I have a question for both speakers, and the question is uh, just a quick one. Uh, the data that you collect, is any of it publicly available? I imagine that if it's a company data, especially when it's related to what's happening in Ukraine, it's not publicly available, but maybe something that comes from the Charles University research. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I, I will start. Uh, in our case, um, we are really open to provide that data that we acquired uh, to anyone who is interested in. So there are a lot, there is a lot of data, for example, for the Krakonosha Mountains. Uh, of course, there is also uh, the, the owner, it is administration of the national park, and also other data, there are, uh, there are some uh, rights, but uh, in general, I think we can uh, find, uh, we can provide it because they would agree to, to provide it. But uh, maybe the different case is uh, with private companies and with uh, data from Maldives. Uh, yeah, we are uh, sending our hyperspectral satellite this year, um, and we're eager to work with anyone who's interested in exploring the ways how to use this data. It will be unique, unique type of data. It will have, um, you know, um, 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 it can collect up to 30 bands at a, you know, a very good uh, spatial resolution. Um, so we were not making publicly available, but um, we're open to anyone to approach us with the idea and with projects to make them available to them. And if I may to jump and add something, the Copernicus Earth observation data is fully open and available worldwide. So there's even some very interesting websites that you can go and see how your city looks like uh, from different, uh, using multiple spectrums that our speakers talk that I don't dare even to mention the technical names, <laughs> but uh, you can even see that. So it's, it's actually quite interesting to explore. And with this said, we go to the, another question from our audience. I just ask really to raise the hand so that we can see we have a question here in the beginning. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Marketa, and I have a question regarding the uh, level of information that we can get from the remote sensing. Uh, if not now, I think that maybe it's not maybe for the satellite, but for other devices. Uh, and regarding the properties in the soil. You mentioned the nitrogen, uh, but can we also use the remote sensing to know uh, what other, uh, for example, chemical substances are in the soil or what materials like microplastic and if, if yes, is it more of an answer that will say that there is something or also an answer what is there? Thank you for the question. Um, I would say it's a bit complicated because um, the, these uh, devices, sensors and uh, radiometers don't see too deep inside the soil. 
but uh, you can see everything that is on the Earth's surface. So if it is uh, there, you can, for example, detect uh, plastics, as you mentioned, and also other uh, nutrients that are important, for example, for agricultural. Uh, and I would mention also other possibility because we don't have just uh, sensors that are uh, carried by uh, UAVs and um, all, all these carriers that I mentioned, but we can use different type of instruments called uh, field or uh, laboratory spectroradiometers. Uh, these are instruments that you can use to scan these uh, spectral features, this spectral curve signature from uh, some sample. So you can collect samples and you can uh, do, this, uh, do these measurements in the field or in the laboratory. Uh, you have um, like um, cable there, optical cable, and when you point uh, the cable on any sample, you will get one spectral signature. Uh, this is of course not uh, for uh, very extensive areas, but in connection with image data, this is very good possibility how to learn more uh, than, uh, and very quickly. Uh, you need not to do some uh, complicated laboratory analysis. You can sometimes connect these um, uh, like spectral measurements also with analysis that you uh, can do in a laboratory. It's the case of chlorophyll, for example, but for soil, uh, there is one big advantage because soil and geological objects in general, they have very specific spectral features that can uh, be used for very accurate detection. So uh, hyperspectral data can help very much, especially in geology and pedology. It's much uh, worse in uh, vegetation, but for these types of uh, surfaces, it's very good. Thank you. I'll, I'll maybe add one more interesting thing that you can actually measure here as well is um, we actually prepared the project for a, for a special call by, by, um, uh, by USPA um, to use Copernicus images and use them for projects in developing countries. So um, it was a very interesting uh, call. Uh, we didn't get the projects, unfortunately, uh, but it was aimed at measuring um, uh, carbon um, uh, sequestration or carbon sinking of, um, 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 in seagrass and in, in forests. So you actually can link a specific carbon characteristics um, uh, to amount of carbon stored in a plant um, if you actually do the, uh, the, the measurement in the lab um, um, and link it together. So that's well, one of the interesting things you can actually do that I think for future would be very valuable to understand you know, how much carbon we're storing in our forests, in our seagrass, um, um, because obviously we have a major problem there. Indeed. And just to spell it out, the acronym ELSPA is the European Union Space program agency and is actually based in Prague and one of its main uh, tasks is precisely to use to leverage or to to promote the use of space state and services so earth observation satellite navigation etc and to transform this data into applications together with uh, research institutions and universities and and companies etc so thank you for bringing that up it's actually a good uh, i think i was on the kickoff of that demonstrator uh, i saw that there was a question coming up from the one to third row i think if you could just raise again your hand thank you very much hello my name is roya ayazi i'm the secretary general of the European network, NEREOS, Network of European Regions Using Space Technologies, and we offer regions a platform to cooperate at a European scale on the use of space, and space data is one of the um, priorities of the interregional cooperation. And we have also a lot of universities with whom we work and education training is a very important topic to be really fit for the next generation to also um, bring the, the system, the Copernicus system forward. One problem we see in all regions and that impacts also the businesses that um, 
it's not very easy to attract talent. Um, a lot of regions give us feedback. We we need more um, geoinformatics specialists. Um, we need more Earth observation specialists. What is your point of view um, to attract more people to the field? Thank you for the question. Um, from my point of view, um, it's, uh, I would say uh, we need some open um, sources that would be available for um, a wide auditorium, uh, available online or maybe uh, also they should need about them because, for example, as I mentioned, we have developed some open uh, courses that uh, are, in our case, uh, focusing on time series of data and their analysis. Uh, and um, I see some uh, problems that uh, maybe still remote sensing is not so uh, well uh, like elaborated or well known because um, people sometimes uh, don't think that they that it can give them such uh, good and detailed information and also what is maybe problem that um, uh, for example in in our case uh, it is uh, there are some rules which methods can be used for evaluation on some uh, environmental features. And remote sensing is not uh, like one possible tool that can be used according to these rules. So uh, this should be also, it is partly a political problem to promote remote sensing and also uh, education. Uh, I think uh, now it is much better. We have many international collaborations and uh, many partners also from other universities, uh, international projects. So I believe it's uh, better and better. And I hope uh, in near future we will have really more specialists uh, and um, many, many people involved uh, and what is important, even if, um, for example, we have very uh, difficult uh, study program, very um, uh, like uh, complicated, our students really like it, uh, and uh, they don't give up. <laughs> and uh, I believe uh, this is the way that maybe really better promotion can help. I'll also comment to that. Um, it's it's very hard for us to um, get get students and uh, get experts. Um, we did several things to help this. Um, uh, one of the things was that we helped to establish the first space engineering program in the Czech Republic, and we work very closely with that. Um, and what we did is that um, uh, students that are part of it um, uh, are offered an in internship at our company. It's 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 a good paid internship. I think it's a very first important step. And next thing is that they're essential part of the company. So we structure our company by different engineering teams that work on different things. And we have a specific team called Pioneers that's made up only of the interns um, that are still studying. And they work on the real projects. They get you know um, uh, the full experience of what it is actually to build things for space. Um, um, and um, it has worked so far very well for us because the people actually want to stay w with us um, after they finish the degree. Um, but it doesn't even start there. We have several programs for high schools and even elementary schools to get the people engaged because you know you might think that high school students are far from the job market, but in the space industry, when you know a, a space exploration mission has a timeline of 10 to 20 years, um, you actually need to start working with high school students because they will be the ones actually building the spacecraft eventually. So um, it's, it's all these things that, we, you know, um, as a company you have to do, I think, um, and, uh, and uh, without it you don't have a workforce. Indeed, and we cannot forget that uh, in Europe, uh, between 48 to 59% of the space workforce is above 50 years old. 
So that means in the next five to 10 years, there will be a lot of job opportunities in our sector. And we have a question in the back, but before I pass, maybe to get a bit inspiration of the young guardians that we have today and maybe bring them to the good side of the force. Could you elaborate, uh, Petr, because I know that you have this background, strategy background, maybe you could elaborate and give some examples on the potential economic and social benefits of using space data, just as an inspiration, in case you are looking for a new uh, career. Um, I mean, everything that we do here is connected to space data, I think. Um, uh, you, you always say that you know you don't have GPS, you don't know where to go, and there's a one a funny uh, anecdote that I like I like to say um, is that when they asked um, a Marine, U.S. Marine, um, um, if he needs internet or if he needs satellites, and he of course answers, no, I don't, I don't need it. I need my rifle to find my enemy, and then my GPS, and that's it. Um, but uh, I think um, um, in, in the developing countries, um, what's interesting uh, with accessing space data um, and Earth observation data is that you can actually see the leapfrogging there. Um, uh, there are, you know, um, uh, th there are completely different problems that they have and, and how, you know, they can leapfrog. Um, um, for example, in Europe, we have developed, you know, a dense network of optical cables for communications. Um, um, in um, a hilly rural areas of Africa, obviously they cannot do that um, to have it everywhere. Um, and quite frankly, if they do have optical cables, um, they lack the um, uh, the maps, um, uh, the construction processes, um, which cause that many times these optical cables are simply cut by someone who's building a new house. Um, that's just a matter of fact. So for them, having an alternative with having a satellite communications means having any type of communications. Um, and you, you know, it, that, that's that's the example that you know that society just develops further um, with space data and s with satellites. Thank you. Lucy, would you like to compliment? You have as full sp possible workforce here in front of you. <laughs> um, yes, I, I think um, th this is very, really very important. As you mentioned, that you have a program for uh, engineers. And uh, I think in our case, uh, we really like when students work on, on the projects because they during already during studies uh, get uh, some practical experiences. And also what is important, uh, they uh, get uh, very easy uh, job in uh, the field of uh, Earth observation because we can see that uh, there are developing many private uh, companies and also in state uh, institutions there are many possibilities so i think one big motivation is for them to see that they can get very good job very easily even during their studies and in our case we really have problems to have uh, students phd students because uh, all these uh, sectors uh, provide big opportunities for students and um, in our uh, PhD scholarship they cannot get such amount of money uh, but still uh, the projects that we have can help so this is the way how to sustain them and uh, they stay with us for longer and they get better education and this is like feedback thank you like uh, i would just like to stress a number of job opportunities in the space sector we do have a question from the back of the room thank you so much for your patience and the floor is yours please uh, good evening my name is Tomasz Falsuczek and uh, my question would have mainly as better uh, i found it very interesting how you mentioned the uh, use of, of uh, or, or the uh, monitoring of the data on forests and, and uh, their carbon uh, storage. And uh, this, I think, one of the many or more examples that could be useful for com private companies. Um, I'm quite wondering if uh, private companies can obtain this data, for example, for the, the, the assessment of their uh, emissions and storage, um, uh, if they can uh, um, obtain this data easily or if it would be very costly uh, for them. And uh, a bit linked to that, do you see potential for development quite large uh, commercialized uh, markets for these uh, data? 
Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, it's, it's actually very interesting because when we looked at it and, and tried to see what the um, you know what the market there is for trading you know data about carbon storage. Um, it's it's really not developed there. Um, many companies are looking into it. Um, many financing institutions are looking into it, um, and it's still in sort of a developing phase. I would say. Um, what is uh, what is the challenge there is that. I think there are different tools. There are different also um, companies that are trying to uh, map the carbon, do the carbon mapping. Um, but there is not a single sort of authoritative source to say how much carbon is stored in what. Um, and I think eventually we will need to have some sort of a certification or some sort of authoritative um, um, source of how much carbon there is. Um, Right now, I think um, you can sort of uh, um, uh, put a stamp on how much carbon you stored where, but um, it's not validated, but validated by anyone. And I think this is still something in development to be actually financeable. Um, but uh, but a lot of the comp a lot of the banks are that's the typical customer that's interested in this data. Uh, but I don't think actually they understand yet how this could be used, how this could be monetized. So um, it's a very early market, and uh, we haven't figured it out either. Uh, there was a question from a gentleman there and two more here. So uh, the gentleman in the green shirt was the first one to raise the hand. If uh, the mic is coming in your direction. And then we have one question here and another one there. Um, hi. So my question is uh, like going back to the Maldives. Unfortunately, I haven't been there, but I noticed that uh, you brought one drone with you. And uh, I, I imagine Maldives are not a big piece of land. And I'm wondering, uh, so my question is about the scalability of the scanning and, and monitoring of an area. Let, let's say I work for the government of the South Moravian region, which is on the blue banner back there. And I want to monitor some parts of land which are maybe agriculturally rich for growing wine or whatever. Um, how long would it take to um, you know, scan and monitor some bigger areas and uh, yeah, and does it make sense to ask for this also? Just quickly, that's the best advertisement for why you need a satellite data. Because you cannot map this much area with just a drone. What we do with the drone and with in-situ mapping is that um, we try to understand the spectral signature um, um, and then automate it. So we just can track it with the whole satellite and apply the say algorithm and automatically detect it, um, uh, but we need that one strip or one area where we actually fly it also with the drone and understand it better. Uh, but then obviously you cannot fly over all of this area, that's why that's what you have satellites for. I would uh, have another meaning maybe a bit. Uh, yes, uh, Peter is right, uh, but we have to consider the features that I mentioned, for example, the spatial resolution from satellites, you have pixel uh, around uh, tens of meters, but from drone you can have really this detail pixel uh, in centimeters. And there are some uh, types of drones, wing drones or VTOLs, uh, drones with uh, vertical takeoff and landing uh, wings, wing drones, uh, that are able to scan uh, relatively big areas. So this is a um, very nice possibility how to get data for bigger areas. And then we have here also the airplanes that can, uh, the, the pixel size is somewhere in the middle and you can have data for big areas. But uh, as I mentioned, each type of carrier can provide different types of data. So your research question is the basic and you have to decide in the beginning of your project which data you would like to use. Thank you. And now we have uh, one question here, and or two more here. So this gentleman here was the first one, please. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I go for social justice. So okay. first come, first serve. 
Yeah, my name is Frank Kessler. I work at the European Commission in the Director General for Regional Development. In the Czech, uh, I'm the desk officer for the Czech Innovation Program for Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises. I'm quite frequently in contact with your Ministry of Industry and, uh, and Trade. So um, I, I had many discussions about uh, Czech aviation industry. It exists even since the 1930s. And there are about 7,000 people in the Czech Republic working in in the aviation industry. And as one state secretary is always saying, the Czechs are one of the few countries in the world which can build their own airplane. So that's quite remarkable for a country of that uh, size. Now, in our um, uh, program, we support SMEs, and we have quite a variety of products. Uh, it goes from the famous Kittel syrup, also from the Liberec area, but we also have drones a company which builds uh, drones in Liberec. It's also an EU project, and it's used for uh, t traffic uh, control and for fires in national parks. I know I've seen the model in uh, Liberec area, and so I think uh, there are some very uh, hopeful uh, projects, and uh, this is something to be built upon. Now, the question for the two of you, do you know this uh, Liberec company with a mini helicopter uh, and uh, for the uh, surveillance. Have you heard about this uh, project? I don't know also. <laughs> but I do hope that they use satellite navigation to know where the drone is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, there's uh, two questions there, that gentleman, and then the other one with the glasses in the back. Yeah, many thanks. Um, I wonder again about uh, scaling up. Um, so thinking about Copernicus and the EU, um, I would dream of a product where you can easily go to the uh, web and uh, have like a map of Europe and you could just zoom in anywhere um, and getting products about forest health, um, maybe water use and agriculture and I guess everybody here in the room can think of others. Um, but you also mentioned the need of local calibration uh, in situ measurements. So yeah, could you maybe just talk a bit mo uh, more about uh, wh where will be the limit um, of like Europe-wide products, um, like in a harmonized interpretation of uh, the spectral um, results, and which um, kind of questions will always be uh, limited to local measurements? Maybe I'll start. Um, I would say that your spectral uh, remote sensing data will always be only as good as your, you know, in situ uh, data and in situ knowledge of the things. So so that's something that's different in every area. Um, different, you know, f from our experience, when we monitored uh, banana trees in the Maldives and when we monitored banana trees in Rwanda, that's a complete, it feels like a completely different plant. It, it works differently, the, obviously the amount of water and, and the soil is completely different. So um, that was like a prime example of why you just have to do a different um, a campaigns to understand it. Um, so that would be it um, for different, different, different regions. I don't know how much into the, you know, how, how small is the micro region where you have to, when you can go with one spectral characterization and where you need to do another one. Um, but maybe to answer the, the first part of your question, having this on the European level, um, um, w we do have a system which is a platform. Um, we can open it on web, on a web page, and it is like a Google Maps, and you can zoom in anywhere, and you can either search from images from the past using um, not only Copernicus and Landsat data, but also commercially procured data from all the satellite imagery providers, and you can also task a satellite and buy yourself a specific image that will either look at the water content, the chlorophyll content, it can detect objects, it can detect vehicles, it can detect aircraft, it has obviously a lot of the security uses, um, but th that's, that, that's a solution like this, but again, um, it might give you a different answer and different precision if you use it across the whole world uh, for something. It works for you know, standardized things like vehicles, aircraft, or um, you know, uh, standardized indexes, which in a standardized way measure chlorophyll content, but it doesn't actually give you the correct, precise answer on the specific plant. So that's, that's the limitation, and that's why you need the calibration locally, I think. 
I would add that uh, the ground truth uh, collection is very important and will be important always. You cannot do uh, any space research without ground truth. And uh, also, uh, after your analysis, you should go back to the field and do validation. Uh, you can find many papers <laughs> that work just, for example, this, uh, with this time series of um, Copernicus data and uh, don't use ground truth. So uh, we cannot um, trust these outputs because we know very well that, uh, for example, these uh, projects in the Krakonosha Mountains, uh, we had very good uh, data collection, very detailed uh, from UA uh, UAVs. And surprisingly, in this case, multispectral data worked almost, uh, performed or mo almost uh, such good like, uh, uh, like hyperspectral. But uh, always, all these results, we had uh, very good accuracies, classifications. We were able to distinguish several types of grasses, uh, very similar grasses. But uh, the main condition is we had botanists in our team, and they, are, uh, they collected ground truth, and we used, this, used it uh, for training. And then we went back to the field and went for validation. And only then you can uh, go for final processing chain and, and final methodology and uh, final automatization of the whole process. Thank you. If I may just add a disclaimer before we go to our next question, that is that gentleman there, and then we have another question there, is that Copernicus is not a true space program. And why? Because actually Copernicus is a system that collects data from multiple sources, satellites in situ, ground, can be even a floating device in the sea, etc. That's why it is. it has a lot of potential. Of course, he has also his limitations, as, as you highlighted here. But of course, it also has a lot of potential. And this data is open and free and available. And actually, you just need an uh, internet connection to access to it. So I, I invite you to explore it a bit. It's actually cool when we start playing with it. I did it myself. So we have the gentleman uh, there in the, that side with a question. Yes, uh, I'm Pinto. I'm working in DG Rijo in the Commission. And I have a question related with the fact that many of the issues that you are uh, addressing, they are uh, very urgent, let's say. Uh, then uh, here the question is, uh, I, eventually you already have the solution. Um, you talk at, at some moment about catastrophes, uh, forest fires, uh, I don't know, uh, boats that they sink. If you can monitor in real time this information and you could take decisions because you know where the fire is going to go because it's, it's drier in this space uh, or other type of decisions, eventually, as you say, with Ukraine, uh, then do you need, because I understand that all the process of the huge amount of data that you collect takes time and the analytics and so on. You can build up models and so on. But do you use some kind of specific software, artificial intelligence, or do you think that this will never reach this kind of almost real-time uh, capacity to react on what you are seeing? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it does take time uh, to process an image on the satellite take it, send it to the ground station, um, receive it, and then s send it to whoever needs it. Um, first of all, the, the pipeline, the processing pipeline, is usually not there in terms of the people and the institutions that need to be sending the information further. But what is also another limiting factor is that, first of all, um, when the, when the satellite is passing over, it takes an image, it needs to wait for it to process it. It has a limiting processing power on board, obviously, so that's one limiting factor. And then it needs to send it to a specific ground station, um, which usually, if we're talking about a, a security satellite, it needs to be a ground station in your country or in your allied country. So that, that can take also a bit of a time. 
Um, there are some um, changes in this whole pipeline. Um, uh, people are starting to use um, an inter-satellite link, so you don't have to wait to send it to your f you know, friendly ground station, but send it through something like Starlink through other satellites um, uh, to yourself. But we're still you know, in you know, at least several minutes um, uh, before it reaches, uh, it reaches the, the end user. Um, and um, you, know, you have to also think about that the satellite passes it takes few seconds. It's above you for very, very small amount of time. Um, it takes a picture and, and sends it. So we're not at a point of you know, having a real-time video, for example, as we would see in maybe some of the Mission Impossible movies or something like this. Um, there are other ways that this could be reached. Um, uh, one of the things that we've been looking into a lot for a while is um, high-altitude platform systems, so th call, things called pseudo-satellites. They're in the stratosphere, about 20 kilometers in the distance. They essentially hover, um, but uh, we haven't gotten the technology um, up there yet, so they would you know, stay there for a long time, but that would be a tool that would allow you constant monitoring over one area um, that is landlocked, um, that can give you a constant um, um, uh, real-time video. Um, but that is, that is the technology that will allow it to do that. If you wanted to do it with satellites, you need many, many satellites. You need many, many constellations. Um, if you're looking at the real-time video, sometimes it's cloudy and you can't do anything about it. Um, you'll have to do you know, a different, for example, uh, radar, radar picture. So um, uh, satellite observation has many, many limits, obviously, and this is one of them. You would like to add something, Lucy, or you pass this one? I would just um, open once again the possibility of UAVs, but still, even in this case, uh, you can be there when you need, but uh, there is a um, lack of this processing chain. We can use um, like uh, very advanced methods, but uh, I think we are missing this uh, processing line. Uh, it's uh, not in uh, like uh, the mode uh, when we could use it, but I believe that uh, in the future there will be maybe elaborated better, uh, better ways. And indeed, there's a lot of potential of space digitalization, including the use of artificial intelligence in the space sector itself. So there's a lot of potential there. And in the fees, we actually look at this type of thing. So happy to have a conversation on that. We have a, a lady there. OK, she already got the mic. This is super efficient. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Audrey. Um, regarding the projects that you have in the in developing countries, uh, what kind of activities do you have to make sure that there is a transfer of know-how, of technologies, um, to ensure sustainability and ownership uh, of the use of this tool. And if you have some concrete example to help me understand, that would be great. Thank you. So the first thing that we try to ensure that the people come back uh, when we do the training, we do internship, is that there is a project that they have lined up that they will be working on in that country. So for example, in Rwanda, um, we do the trainings on some of our satellites that we're building in the Czech Republic, but this year we're launching a manufacturing of a satellite in Rwanda that they're doing the training for. So a lot of times when we come to these countries, many of them did sort of a developing, you know, uh, um, they did projects to build satellites with other big space faring countries where they promised to, to teach them and, 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 and teach them how to build things and how to learn, but if there's not a, like a sustainable way of uh, sustainable projects after this lined up, then they just go elsewhere and leave the country and, and, and uh, get the job somewhere else. So um, what we're trying to do here, to have a local company uh, that is has a local ownership um, um, and that has long-term projects um, um, in terms of manufacturing satellites there, so the people can have something to come back to. Um, and obviously in Africa, in Asia, there is a market itself to be served in those areas. Um, I think you know, um, every African country should have their own satellites to have independent, you know, um, access to data. Um, and I don't think those satellites should be manufactured in Europe or in the Western world. They should be manufactured in themselves. Um, and uh, that's sort of the approach that we're taking. So that's why we're spending a lot of time on de teaching them and making sure that the people have something to come back to. Thank you. We have one question there, another one at the end. And another one there, and then we will need to close uh, due to time. So those two people flagged will need to wait a little bit more, and then that one. 
Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Christian, and I have a question specifically for Peter, I think, and it's about the security measures with the leader system you installed. What's the, how do you evaluate the risk of uh, being hit by some fast moving object? Uh, maybe about cascading effects and catastrophic events in space that are potentially to happen rather sooner than later, I think. And what's the percentage of the computation uh, limitations of the satellite? Thank you very much. Um, that, that's, a that's a big problem that we're facing. Um, if you think about how we destroyed and littered our own planet, you just should think about how we littered the uh, orbits of Earth. Um, it's even worse. And um, th the big problem there is that we do not see um, uh, where the objects or where satellites are actually flying um, around the Earth. Um, the, the average, you know, the most accessible data about objects in space and satellites in space are within, air, within margin of error of hundreds of meters. So when we look at something and we see, okay, well, we computate that there might be a potential collision, um, we actually don't know. And when satellites are on the orbit, they uh, regularly do collision avoidance maneuvers, um, uh, but 99% of these collision avoidance maneuvers are essentially false because they don't need to do them because we just don't, not, don't have the data. Um, and with the growing amount of satellites on orbit, um, just Starlink itself, did 50,000 collision avoidance maneuvers in six months. Um, they have 4,000 satellites now. They're supposed to have 40,000 satellites. So the problem with that is that every second, there will be you know, several collision avoidance maneuvers, which changes the whole picture, the whole dynamic. So the whole movement of 100,000 satellites on orbit is changing every second. And it makes it even nearly impossible to predict um, because every sensor, and we measure it from Earth, makes it have its own ground truth, kind of. Um, they see things differently. Um, and when you see them from a different you know, perspective, you see them differently in terms of meters. Um, and that can have, obviously, um, a devastating effect. Um, because if two objects hit, they create thousands of pieces that can hit another satellite, and you get to the so-called Kessler syndrome. So um, there is a limitation. There are things that also play in our favor. For example, we figured out that um, when you have a satellite and it will come to a close approach and potential collision with another satellite, you have several orbits prior to this close approach where you, know, um, where you get very close to it. And it allows you to sort of look at it and determine where precisely that object is so you know that it will hit you, it will not hit you. So, so that's sort of an approach and opportunity that you're taking. And also, you know, it's, it's the objects that are the most dangerous to your satellites are not the ones that are around you. They're the ones that are on the other side of the, of the planet orbiting and potentially in several orbits hitting you. Um, so it gives you a bit of time, um, but what is definitely not possible is to have a sensor and, and our sensor and look at things and see a satellite that is approaching us calculating that it might head hit us and avoiding it. That's, there are some functions that are being developed to have automated collision avoidance uh, you know, man maneuverability, um, but this is beyond you know, the speed. So um, because you have the opportunity to see them several orbits prior, it gives you a bit more time to sort of calculate it, et cetera. But I would just say that we're, you know, we, we're not managing our orbits properly. We don't have the tools yet, and we're definitely running into some sort of a problem eventually with this. Conclusion is the gravity movie and the collision that happens in the beginning is not so far from reality, actually, right? Uh, the part of Sandra Bullock at the end arriving Earth and getting up and walking, that's a different story. But not the collision, not the garbage around, and not the effects that it can have. So definitely something that we need to be mindful of. There was another two more questions that I promised, one in the back and one here in the front. I'm just not sure where the microphone is. In the back. Okay, super. Thank you. Hi, uh, Sibyl Meffre from uh, Police Network. So I just wanted to know if there were some concrete uh, use of uh, data space for transport to improve transport networks and uh, perhaps traffic management. Uh, 
Yeah, I think th th there's plenty. I mean, um, any Google Maps app, any any um, navigation apps are rely on that. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, applications being developed for um, uh, rail network as well, um, 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 especially in Europe, um, and um, for air traffic control. I think obviously that's that's another point. Um, but maybe maybe you can yeah, fill me in. I can add a few things. Uh, think about uh, e-call regulation, for example. That uh, that uses satellite navigation, for example digital tachograph, uh, everything that is linked to networks. So rail, for example, is one of them uh, that is being also using a, a satellite navigation. Prague, for example, they actually, the tram system in Prague is using satellite navigation, Galileo more specifically, and that actually for helped them to become more efficient. And for example, extending the life uh, use of the trams, reducing maintenance also. So not only reduces the costs, but also prolonging their life. So this is a very concrete example in a city. Everything that you think about mobility as a service, for example, with multiple platforms, usually they also use satellite navigation for that. Um, and if you think, for example, monitoring the roads and the condition of the roads, you can also use uh, Earth observation to do that, for example, and that will help you also to do better your planning for it. So this is just a few examples off top of my head, but if you want, I can point you uh, after this to some uh, more detailed uh, information on what concerns mobility. And we had the final question here for the gentleman. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Roman. Uh, I have two questions, actually, one perhaps to both of you and the second one to Peter. Uh, the first one is related to, <clears throat> perhaps you have already explained uh, the importance of, uh, what is it, calibration and validation in situ, et cetera. But perhaps uh, you have noticed also, as we did in Brussels, there were farmer protests uh, in, in the streets. They were not only in Brussels, they were also in a couple of other countries, including Prague. And part of the problems the, the farmers uh, complained about was linked to satellite or to remote sensing and remote validation of the information the farmers are obliged to provide to the authorities, national or later on to the commission. And the problem is that the, the data provided uh, by uh, the remote sensing were not accurate. And it was creating problems for farmers with very specific and uh, uh, well complicated uh, situation for them. They needed to explain that, et cetera, et cetera. So whether you could comment on that, what uh, perhaps from your perspectives might help in improving the reliability of uh, of these processes. And the second question is related to the garbage, to the space garbage. My question is whether there are discussions on, you know, how to put some rules on that traffic in, in, the, in space, on orbit, and whether there are any thoughts regarding uh, not only preventing the crashes, but also cleaning up the orbit, so collecting and removing the garbage. Perhaps the gravity helps a lot, but, uh, uh, whether there is any discussion or any thoughts in that direction. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I, I would start with uh, the first one. Uh, I think this is uh, one big problem of uh, space uh, data now uh, that still the, the accuracy doesn't meet needs of some sectors or uh, groups. And uh, especially when we use uh, this Copernicus data, uh, which uh, have pixel at uh, the best case around 25 cent uh, meters and, uh, sat uh, and uh, uh, also some uh, bands have 10 meters, this is very good. Uh, but we have also possibilities of some uh, private companies that uh, provide satellite uh, satellites. They have even much better spatial resolution, but it is expensive. So this is some message for maybe for the future that for uh, when when um, like control systems and uh, institutions really ask for uh, from in this case from farmers to use the data they they need to be accurate and but i believe that uh, the technical uh, 
uh, advances are so quick that it uh, it's just a question of time and of course it uh, doesn't prevent uh, current protests of farmers but uh, I believe that they will be able soon uh, to use the data in, in uh, sufficient resolution. Uh, th thank you for mentioning that. I did not know that one of the reasons for the protest was this, so that's, that's very interesting to me. I'll, but I'll address the, the, the later question on the space debris. Um, it, it, is interesting pro it is an interesting problem because it is a shared commons of humanity, and we need to figure out a way how to manage it. But we have no precedent of you know, managing a shared commons well anywhere. So um, it's very hard. There are rules. Um, uh, there are new rules. Um, uh, the EU and, and, and ESA have um, uh, uh, started this uh, zero debris policy and, and new rules of making sure that um, everyone who sends a satellite up there makes sure that um, it has, you know, um, um, it follows rules, that it doesn't create another space debris, that it has a, de a de defined lifetime after, uh, after which it is disposed. Um, uh, but the problem is that, for example, for the debris for the small pieces, um, at now there's no point of finding out and figuring out who are the owners of the 130 million of one centimeter pieces of debris up there. We can find the culprits, we can find that countries that did the anti-satellite weapons testing, um, recently China, recently Russia, in the past, European countries as well as the United States, um, uh, but that's many years ago and uh, you really cannot track individual pieces of debris to that. Um, so, so, so this is a hard one. Um, removing space debris depends how big you mean. Um, if you want to remove a big satellite, um, a European Space Agency is carrying out a mission to remove a big, spa big satellite from the orbit. Um, uh, but that, those are the easy things to do. Those are the easy things to monitor. Uh, we cannot track very, very small pieces, um, and that's 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 when it gets hard. Um, um, there are ways to do this. Um, for example, ground-based laser um, uh, momentum transfer. Um, there is technology to use laser to slow down the pieces of debris as they're uh, coming um, uh, on the horizon. Um, you slow them down, which means they start falling through the through atmosphere, and that's essentially how we get rid of all the space debris. Eventually, it gets to the graveyard orbit and falls through the atmosphere and burns up. That's how majority of satellites are designed to end their life. What we are finding out right now is that it's not as safe as we thought. A satellite burning up in the atmosphere releases so many, you know, um, um, gases, um, um, acids, and very, um, you know, heavily dangerous substances with which we pollute our atmosphere. Um, and we're just finding out about this, and I would say that we will see a lot of discussions and, and, and talks about how do we actually deal with this, because that's how every, every single satellite is designed. And it wasn't a problem until now, when Elon Musk announced that he will need to retire a very, very small portion of you know, all of his satellite fleet, which is hundreds of satellites that will need to burn in the atmosphere, and that's when it becomes a problem. So I would say it's, um, uh, we don't know yet. We need to figure out as a humanity how to, um, uh, how to regulate and manage a shared space, which we do not know how. If I may add to that, um, there's also a question of intellectual property. So it means that, for example, when we are removing a satellite, you need to own the satellite. You cannot remove a satellite from someone else without having the authorization. Uh, and so this is actually, uh, from legal and policy aspects, l years of discussion. I remember that one of the most original projects I saw was a Swiss company that had a vacuum cleaner to vacuum clean space debris. So you do see a lot of creativity, but then you, you, know, you, you hit some legal aspects that are not neglectable, and, and sometimes it doesn't make the process deal very fast. Uh, what you just mentioned about the re-entry is usually the beautiful shooting stars that we uh, make wishes upon. Uh, most likely that's a satellite coming in, except in November and August when we have actually meteoritis uh, uh, rain, uh, showers coming in towards the atmosphere, and indeed it is a concern. There's still a lot of unknowns, as you were saying, especially on this effects on high um, altitudes and the re-entries, there's still a lot of unknowns. There's still a lot of opportunities also for science and for universities uh, to develop what we call the characterization models on how we measure these impacts and all this data. 
Also, what I would like to finish from my side, and then I would like a final message from our speakers to close our event today, is that be, pay attention to the Europa website because the European Union is working actually in the first uh, European Union space law that addresses precisely these concerns of uh, sustainability, safety, and environmental aspects of the space activities. Uh, and it will be quite a mark in uh, the history of space law and of space. Um, and it tries precisely to address some of these concerns into the limits that is possible, of course. So stay tuned, because uh, soon there will be more news on that. Uh, and before we close our event, uh, I would like to pass the floor to Lucy for a final short message that you would like our audience to bring with them back home. Thank you, Vera. My message would be that um, I see the great possibilities of uh, Earth observation, uh, remote sensing and space sciences, mainly for the young generation. And I believe there will be many opportunities, uh, projects, uh, science, education, and uh, everything will be very fast. And um, for example, as we uh, mentioned, these resolutions, I believe that uh, this will be issue uh, on the next years and we will be soon able to work with very detailed data. Thank you, Petr. Final message? Um, I'll just say that uh, space is closer than you think. Um, it's closer than you think in all the applications, all the use cases, um, uh, the way you get to your work, uh, to your job, um, how, the way you communicate, to the basic security, um, as we see in, uh, in, in, in the east of Europe. Um, and it's closer than you think in terms of engagement and getting you involved in space. Um, I did not study space engineering. I studied political science. Um, uh, but uh, even for humanities, space ex is accessible. Um, and it's also closer than you think in terms of Europe uh, being a geopolitical actor in space, um, having its own um, uh, you know, lunar settlements and missions to the moon. So um, just stay close to space. And with this, I would like to thank you all for your interest and for being here today. I would like to thank your hosts and above all to our speakers. I do hope that you felt inspired tonight. Uh, I learned a few things. Also, I work in space for, the, for 11, almost 11 years, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for your interest in these topics, for being here, for listening, for asking questions. And of course, uh, we will still, our speakers will still be here around a bit longer, so if you have any other questions that you would like to address with them, please feel free. And I do hope that you enjoy your evening, and I do hope to see you in one year again to, again, another discussion on the Science Cafe about space. So thank you so much, and have a nice evening. Good evening, once again. I will be very short. Uh, from the Czech Center of Brussels side, I would like to thank both our speakers, Lucien and Peter, and our moderator, Vera, who we can always count on when it comes to an Earth-related uh, topic. And if you accidentally happen to be into not just Earth observation, but also documentary film, I would like to invite you to the closing ceremony of Jihlava International Documentary Film Festival uh, that uh, takes place next Thursday here at uh, Prague House. Thank you all for your questions and uh, for coming. And uh, last but not least, I would like to uh, thank uh, to all members of uh, our four teams. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, also today we have uh, one specialty, maybe uh, you already saw it, uh, Temnalona, which is uh, lightning uh, in the garden behind you. It's the masterpiece of uh, Design uh, Studio Visualové and uh, Brno Observatory in the South Moravian region. Uh, you can also come closer and uh, see the light smoke uh, around the earth and uh, also uh, aurora, but please do not uh, touch it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, I would like to also invite you downstairs uh, where you can try our South Moravian wine. And also because it's still February, you can also taste uh, non-alcoholic wine. 
So, cheers. Thank you very much.